Hello, everyone. Semi-retired Bob here. My guest today needs no introduction. I have Professor Bart Kay here with us today. I can't imagine there's anyone watching my channel that does not know who you are as much as I refer to your channel on mine. But please go ahead and take a few moments and tell everybody who you are. All right. Well, it, you've kind of nailed it there, Bob. It's uh, Professor Bart Kay's The Handle. I used to be an academic for about 20 years, teaching health science to both undergraduates and eventually to postgraduates as well. Um, thought much better of academia, the whole institution, the whole idea, and decided in a fit of madness one day that I was going to be a, an online social media influencer instead. Uh, somebody told me that YouTube was the way to do that, so I started a YouTube channel. Uh, and now five years later, I've got five YouTube channels and um, a few people interested in what I've got to say, which is great, I think. Yes, indeed. There are a few people interested in what you had to say out there. And I came up with an idea that I thought would be kind of fun just for the first little bit of this interview. Um, you use some terms in your videos that some people might not be familiar with. So I thought perhaps we could do a little instructional video here on how to watch a Professor K video and understand what the heck is this madman talking about? Yeah. So I thought one of the things that you talk about a lot is you accuse people of being reductionist or this is a reductionism thing. Can you give us just a few moments re explanation of what is reductionism? Absolutely. Reductionism in practice, scientifically, is the habit of, and the necessity, in fact, of picking on a relationship between variable A and variable B in isolation to how variables A and B interact with variables C, D, E, F, or G. When you're doing science, you kind of have to do that what you are imagined as a scientist to have done is okay fine focus on a and b but control c d e f and g don't let them freely vary vary to whatever degree because if they're not controlled if they're allowed to vary then your relationship between a and b is no good you still don't know what it is because other things have played in um, when I say to someone, oh, that's a reductionist idea or a reductionist argument, what I am inferring is that the people have been told by someone, look, here are two cogs from a Datsun 180B gearbox from 1984, and then expect you to construct that gearbox from those two gears. That's not going to work. You won't have the information to do it. And so, look, here are the two gears. Now you know everything about the gearbox is a reductionist idea. It's, it's, a, it's a fallacy. It's, it's a folly. It's, it's a bit foolish. Yeah. Okay. So to reduce something is to make it more simple in the world. Sorry, to make it more simple than it is in the world. Precisely because when you're manipulating models, models have to have a set number of vertices, don't they? The more of them there are, the more difficult it is to trace them. So the reductionist approach is to, like a classic example is, if I was going to estimate the volume of my body, then I might represent my upper arm as a cylinder. It's a reductionist model of my upper arm. It might serve for a gross estimate of my body volume, but it does not represent what my upper arm is. I hope that kind of clarifies it. Yes, yes, it does, which brings me, because of the things you talked about there with variables C, D, E, and F, and so on, I'm assuming that that is where degrees of freedom um, in, comes into play as well. Yeah, so a degree of freedom is a variable that is not under control. 
um, it's anything that is left free to vary. A degree of freedom. Two others that I want to get into here very quickly. Um, the one thing that you say quite often is that they are building a straw man argument against yep. something or for something. Yep. I think that can use some explaining as well. Sure. A, a straw man argument is one where I take something you have not said, Bob, and then I debunk what you didn't say completely. For the, for the sole purpose of deriding you, degrading your um, credibility, but actually not addressing your actual argument at all. Okay, and one final one here. I have to question begging the question. What what are we talking about when you say something? I mean, we all know what fallacy is. At least we should. If we don't, yeah. we probably should go back to school. But when you say that's a begging the question fallacy, what specifically right. are we talking about here? It's a faulty logical premise whereby the obvious conclusion to any solution is obviously the solution to that so long as the first instance the premise we started with was correct so up until the recent lmhr paper that was published this week a lot of the antithetical and antithetical folks to us shall we say those in the church of anorexia vegana have been running around saying, well, if you eat saturated fat, we know that increases your LDL cholesterol level. Ergo, it's bad for you. Well, that's begging the question because the underlying premise is that LDL cholesterol is bad for you. So that's the begging the question fallacy. What it is is that it's just saying I'm right, assuming I'm right, not establishing that I'm right, and moving forward with that proposition as the starting point of the logical framework. And it's obviously a fallacy because in this case, for example, what we do know is several things now. Now we know actually that the diet seems to have very little effect on the so-called LDL cholesterol. So the first part of that premise is false anyway. Uh, and we've known, well, I've known for 20 something years that the second part was false that cholesterol causes heart disease somehow. No, it doesn't. So yeah, begging the question fallacy, that's what that one is. Well, hopefully this first little part of the video will help some of my viewers when they're watching your content. And I suggest they always watch your content. I know I always do. I've watched everything you have on your YouTube channel. And I occasionally, when I run out of things I'm interested in watching, will take an odyssey journey off to another land to watch some other things. And I suggest yes. everybody does that as well. Yes. Now, I wanna talk about studies just a little bit here. One of the things that I have said on my channel that I'm hopeful that you'll agree with, because I'd hate to end up as the recipient of a who's wrong on the interwebs today. We all know that cigarette smoking, while strongly associated with causing lung cancer or is strongly associated with lung cancer. You cannot yeah. say smoking causes lung cancer because it, 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 all of the research was associative studies. What I have said on my channel is that if we think of the association between smoking and lung cancer as the book War and Peace, all of the other studies that are out there they're trying to take a single page of the book War and Peace and convince you that this is the entire book and it means just as much as the other, if you understand what I'm saying here. Yeah, I don't know what your problem is, Bob. All those pages have got words on them. So once you've seen a page of words, you must have all the words, surely. Of course. <laughs> yeah. But how do you... Knowing all of that about studies, how do you interpret these studies? And are there any actual studies out there that my viewers can go to? Because I am constantly, I try to tell them, look, 
if you watch Professor K, he will explain to you why high LDL, which isn't actually cholesterol, but why that's not a bad thing. And they seem to get it. And then all of a sudden, a couple of weeks later, they're like, oh, well, I have to leave now because I went to my doctor and my LDL was X. And he said, that that's just a full hard stop. Are there any actual studies out there that can inform us on that type of thing? No. Not a single one. If your framework, if your um, view is that you want to talk about cause and effect, this causes that. In that case, you need experimental, properly designed, properly powered, properly randomized, properly controlled, properly observed metabolic ward lock-in studies on human beings, genetic sets of twins, locked in labs at birth and having had every aspect of their lives absolutely uh, identical in each lab, the only thing differing being the thing that you want to point the finger or blame at it causing some disease or something like that. Failing that, because we're never going to have that, there's just no way to do that kind of research, ethically, morally, financially, practically, or in any other way. What we have to rely on is inference. So there's a real difference between cause and effect, period, fact, and inference. It looks like maybe this, that, or the other thing. Then all you need to do is assess the veracity of the inference. How good an inference is this one? So let's compare the incidence of lung cancer diagnoses in groups of individuals per pack year of smoking com uh, compared with their reference of similar age stage, you know, everything relatively similar, but large populations who do not smoke. That's one kind of inference in terms of this associates to that. So no, you're, you're quite right. We absolutely cannot say this causes that full stop. However, the default line in terms of smoking is generally just to go, look, you might as well say it causes it because the association is pretty damned powerful. Here's what we get. For every pack year of smoking, which is 20 cigarettes a day or equivalent for a year, there is an 11,500% increase in the incidence of lung cancer. Now, people poke straw men at me. Here we go. Here's an example of a straw man. People that will comment on me will say, he's saying that smoking doesn't cause lung cancer. No, I'm saying there's no evidence that we can provide that it does, which is correct. However, 11,500% is pretty damn convincing, is it not? Which is a completely different thing. That's what I actually did say, for example. Um, and you compare that to what you look at when you look at something like an LDL study. Somebody's LDL level or a, or a large group of people's LDL levels versus their incidence of heart disease. You get quite a wide range. You, you get some studies that say there's no real relationship here at all. You get a few that say, yes, there's a relationship. And then they make that relationship look a lot bigger than it is so that they make themselves sound important in the way they report it. And some studies even find a decrease in heart disease incidence as that relates to cholesterol. So this association is wishy-washy. It's weak at best. It's around, the most severe I've ever seen is around 30% relative. Now that relative that I stressed there is a very important word. Here's what they do to make that number sound like, oh, that's 30% increase. That, that must be something, surely. What am I talking about? Am I nuts? Well, here's the question. 30% of what? Thirty percent of baseline rate. So the only way to know how powerful that statistic is is to go back and find out what the baseline was in the one equals zero risk referent group. And what you find out is that in such studies, typically the death rate is 
eight per 10,000 person years of follow up. Eight per 10,000. So a 30% increase on that is what? 24 per 100,000 person years of follow up. So in terms of an actual, practical, real-world, meaningful change in incidence, even if that was a cause and effect relationship, which it is not, it's an association, but let's just imagine it's causal for fun. That means my exact chances of dying of heart disease, which has gone up because of this cholesterol, is 24 chances in 100,000 per year. Past the state. Yeah, that's the the relative versus association. I talk about that quite a bit on my channel as well because you know everybody always wants to talk. But statins, though, yeah. Like, well, yeah, it is true that statins reduce your risk by fifty percent. But then when you look at the actual numbers and discover that that's a half a percent versus a whole percent. And taking a statin and all of its side effects over multiple years might, might get you eight extra days of life. Is it really worth that? I don't think so. No, I don't either for the side effects that are quite likely on that particular medication. Um, knowing full well about its pharmacology, my personal opinion, this is not medical advice in any way, shape or form, this is my personal opinion is that nobody should touch that drug with a large pole under any circumstances. I wouldn't Thank go you. anywhere near it personally at all, and I never will. I have my own statin story because I was on one for multiple years, but anybody that wants to know about that can go tune into some of my other videos where I talk about that. We have you here today, so let's press on with the important work that you're doing. One of the burning questions that I have had for a long time, and I'm okay. Gluconeogenesis. Is it demand driven or isn't it? Or is it a combination um, thereof? Right. Most of the time, it's demand driven, i.e., in any postprandial stage, basically. Your body is metering and gauging how much glucose is in your blood, and if it detects a drop in your blood glucose, it will upregulate the gluconeogenesis to maintain a homeostatic level. The only time that gluconeogenesis becomes supply driven is if you punch in too much supply. That can't be dealt with in another way. And then your body goes, well, it goes through this pathway then. And I'm thinking of too much protein as the obvious example. Um, once your body has absorbed all the protein it can and all the amino acid pools are replete and there's nowhere else for amino acid to go, then it's going to start deaminating, i.e. gluconeogenesis. That's, that's a fait accompli at a certain point. But most of the time, yeah, demand-driven, demand-driven, demand-driven. That's why your blood glucose remains really stable on a carnivore diet throughout the day, the only time you're going to get any meaningful diversion away from your baseline blood glucose level is in the hour or two after your one meal a day and probably in the morning as part of the, the, the normal dawn phenomenon. The rest of the day you're going to be flatlined at around somewhere between 95 and 105 probably. Whereas these people that eat a lot of carbohydrates are going to be all over the dial throughout the day. They're going to be up and down. And that's why they eat so many times a day. Because every time they eat, it drags their blood sugar down lower than it was before they ate an hour or two afterwards. So they have to eat again. So they're doing this great big roller coaster. And we're just. I'm glad you brought all that up because that leads straight into my next two questions here. Um, because you and I both advocate for basically one meal a day 
to get that big bolus of protein to actually get your insulin to not spike, but bump a little bit. Can yes. you explain, can you please explain to people why it is that we want that bump to happen? Yeah, absolutely. Once a day or once every other day, if you're fasting on 48s or something like that, regularly is what I mean, and not too many days in between. You want at least one kind of blip, like so, as Bob was indicating, in your insulin response. And you want it because that keeps your thyroid functioning properly. It prevents your kidney tissue becoming leaky and leaking all your electrolytes out. Insulin does many things in the body. It's not just the marshal of sugar into cells. It's also all sorts of other jobs, and I've just outlined a couple of them for you. So a person who's always trying to avoid being kicked out of ketosis and to stay in ketosis all the time because they have this idea that they need to be in ketosis for some reason, um, that person is probably not doing themselves any favors because sooner or later at some point, thyroid, kidney function, or both is going to start to go off. It's the very reason that there was a selective knockout of one of the uh, ketogenic genes in the Inuit. They now find another way to achieve the same thing that the ketones achieve, which is basically a temporal and spatial energy buffer. And, and it acts between fat and sugar, supplying the energy yeah, to match what's required. So the Inuit find another way around that, and as such, don't end up with those issues. So there is actually no natural native group of people who would have avoided being kicked out of ketosis because they didn't even know what it was. What they did is eat heartily every time they took down a beast. They had a they had a a gathering and they celebrated the successful hunt and they cooked up the meat and they ate all the meat and everybody ate until they were rifting. And then they probably ate again a couple of days later. Sort of thing. So that's kind of what we're mimicking with this one meal a day. Let's not eat like rabbits. We're not rabbits. Um, let's eat like human beings, i.e. once a day or once every other day, eat heartily, so long as heartily means as much meat and fat as you can eat, sort of, sort of thing. Okay. And then you mentioned the spiking of the blood sugar up and down peaks and valleys and all of that. One of the things we see occasionally I, w I don't want to say commonly because it, I don't think it's that common, but we do occasionally see people that have been full carnivore for a certain amount of time, their A1C begins to creep up back up towards that 6 or even 6.1 range in that. Yep. Um, can you explain why, in your yep. opinion, that this is not really a problem and it's not pathological? Absolutely. So there are several factors there. Number one, there is a recent paper that establishes now the idea that red blood cells are living longer in carnivore populations and the mechanism by which that is occurring. Um, I'm away this week on, uh, on other missions around other parts of the country, but if anybody desperately wants me to dig that reference out at some point, let Bob know and I'll see if I can write it through and find that for you. So that's now seems to be a more solid argument because there's at least one paper that says, well, yeah, look, this is, this is it happening. So if your red blood cells do live longer, then your A1C value will go up because the A1C value, or the ideal A1C value, assumes a lifespan of red blood cells which is shorter than the lifespan that your red blood cells have. So it's an inappropriate gauge on your red blood cells. Secondly, the more and more fat adapted you get, the more and more your body relies on gluconeogenesis, the less 
it's expecting that at some stage miraculously soon you're going to pour in carbohydrates and it starts just provisioning enough glucose into your blood and so the gluconeogenic rate does and can drift up the reason it's not pathological or a problem is because when you look at a, a person who eats a standard diet or a diabetic person the saying okay if your a1c is much over a certain value i think it's 6.7 from memory then you are a diabetic you are a type 2 diabetic then that assumes that there is big spiking and troughing spiking and troughing and, and that's the average value that's associated with these spikes up here it's the spikes up here that do the damage very high blood glucose is the problem not the average value but they're saying the average value is the problem because that's what they're testing by doing the a1c so again it's a metric that it's a piece of kit it's a tool that is supposed to measure something but it's not appropriate for task here because it only accurately gives you a gauge on someone's blood glucose control in the case where they're eating that standard diet and doing that there is no evidence whatsoever that consistently and persistently having an a, a blood glucose between 95 and 110 is going to be a problem for anybody long term because that's not the level at which glucose starts to really damage tissues so you can drift along at that level indefinitely and, and not expect that there's going to be a major malfunction I consider myself one of the lucky ones because I did the most bad thing you can possibly do according to you, and I am one of the lucky ones. I was standard American diet one day and 100% carnivore the next day. I'm now almost two years in, so I don't expect to encounter any problems at this point. If I do, I'll be certainly certain to call you, but I have stop saying i don't think it will actually hurt you on my channel because i've watched enough of your videos where i believe it might actually cause problems so for my audience could you please explain to us why you do not want to change your diet from one thing to another rapidly yeah absolutely i'm glad you got away with it Bob. by the way some people do and you're one of those mm -hmm. ones who had a particular constitution and lucky enough to have the right circumstances in play that you didn't have a, a major meltdown so that's great but the reason that a person a given person should not do that is because it invites the following problem in your colon there is a group of bacteria that live with you all the time that help you to break down various substances a little bit and they produce various neurotransmitters and do various things but mostly they're there for their own ends they're there because you're you're a safe environment to live in it's warm they have all the moisture they need there's a constant supply of nutrients it's fantastic and so they come to a peaceable arrangement amongst themselves about how many of each species there's going to be and how they're going to colonize and everybody's happy and then you change the supply chain completely to some different form of diet so let's say you're on the standard diet so there was a whole bunch of carbohydrate coming in fiber and plant materials and all of that and then you go oh, i'm going to hammer over tomorrow and go carnivore and you remove all that stuff and now you're just piling in the meat and fat those bacteria who are expecting to be fed sugar are not best pleased with the fact that you're not providing any so the first thing they'll do is they'll go to war with each other for limited resources part of that warfare is the exuding of deadly chemicals to kill off other bacteria so that they can be the last ones left and prevail and you know for what limited resources there are that tends to upset the gut lining quite a bit once the gut lining is upset that sets off chronic systemic inflammation if it's not resolved and you can end up with any of those disease processes which we know absolutely are all underpinned by inflammation those being 
type two diabetes, type one diabetes as well to some degree, obesity, overweightness, the so-called metabolic syndrome, so-called insulin resistance, so-called, you know, fat induced heart disease. No, it's inflammatory, um, strokes, most forms of dementia, all the big killers in Western society, basically, they're all based on inflammation. So you don't want to upset your gut because in the long term, that's bad. And in the short term, it means that everything can go very custard shaped, quite literally, in terms of your gut function. And, um, you know, you can actually have some quite serious dysbiosis. One of the things that the these bugs can do if they're not fighting with each other is they can go, we're just going to go into stasis now because there's not enough food. So they'll actually go munch, 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 like Pac-Man and eat into the wall of your colon and then encapsulate themselves and stay there until they sense that conditions are improved or something. Some of them can last months and months and months before they actually finally die and get injected. And all that time that they're in there, they're irritating the, the colon, causing that inflammation, leading to the, those issues, that atherosclerosis, those, those strokes, those heart attacks leading to the, the likelihood to carry more body fat and to add body fat, throwing your metabolism into the wrong gear, messing with your hormones. It's an, it's, it's an insidious thing. So what I suggest is that if you do want to change your diet from anything to anything else, actually, that you take six, eight weeks over that transition. Do it slowly and steadily. Let, your, let everything adjust slowly so that you don't, set off an all-out war basically you are a cardiovascular pathophysiologist so you know quite a bit about this and while i know there is no study out there that can there's no way to say this is definitely the cause and this is this is what happens but in your educated opinion since we have decided that it's not ldl that causes heart disease that's almost a given even though i can't say it's definitely not because we don't have any proof can you tell us in your opinion what are the actual um probable causes of heart disease right okay this is a fascinating one and and it's one that you know obviously i've studied for several decades um, I've contributed to the peer-reviewed literature in this field. I've taught it to pre-med students and you know others that are going to end up working in the NHS health services in the UK and in other parts of, of the world as well. And it's always interesting when when people suggest, you know, is there any reason to suggest that LDL is not causal in heart disease? And I always say, well, I'm not saying you're, you're wrong there, Bob, at all, that there's no reason to say it's not. But here's one for you. Atherosclerosis, heart disease, occurs in the arteries. It does not occur in veins. Those arteries and veins carry the self same blood do they not yes they do. the self same cholesterol carried by the same carriers <laughs> and yet on the venous side of your circulation no atherosclerosis none okay have a heart bypass operation because you've got atherosclerosis in your heart what do they do they take a vein out of your leg which will never have atherosclerosis in it because it's a vein, and they'll stick it in where the bridging work needs to be done in the heart. And then guess what happens over the next few years? That vein starts to develop atherosclerosis. So, for my money, I am prepared to say it looks like LDL and or any cholesterol and or any fraction of cholesterol and or any of the lob the lipoproteins i am prepared to say none of them are causally involved in heart disease and atherosclerosis 
because if they were, atherosclerosis would develop in veins just as much as it does in arteries. And it doesn't. Ever. So what's the difference? Well, two things. Blood pressure and blood turbulence. The thing that most high, highly correlates to atherosclerotic lesioning is the sheer rate of blood going past the epithelial cell consumed. So where the blood flows in a fairly laminar, fairly low pressure way through the veins, it just flows through, no problem, it doesn't, it doesn't cause an issue, and it's at relatively low pressure. Ramp that pressure up as it is on the high pressure side of the vasculature, and have bifurcations, Y-shaped bifurcations, for example, or the aortic arch, some of these structures in the high pressure side that subserve getting the blood where it needs to be, but are not best used to dealing with basically the turbulence around those bifurcations or around sending fluid through an arch. Where the turbulence is occurring, the sheer rate of the blood at that point in the vascular tree is reduced. That blood hangs around a lot longer before being forced away by the next blood. And as such, it exerts pressure for much longer at much higher pressures and pulsatile every time the heart beats. Because the other thing about atherosclerosis is they always occur in arteries bigger than about that. Never the smaller arteries either. So it's all about pressure and turbulence. The only other thing we now need is susceptibility of that tissue. So we need to inflame that tissue or physically damage that tissue or chemically derange the system in some way to make that tissue vulnerable to that problem. And that's easy. All we need to do to, to get that to happen is to elevate our blood sugar level above what it should be naturally. That will serve, actually that will kill two birds with one stone because that will cause glycation of the tissues, which is immediately damaging. And it will raise the blood pressure because if you eat a lot of carbohydrate, you will have too much insulin being produced chronically and that will prevent your kidneys from filtering sodium out. That's the cause of high blood pressure, not salt. Because if you're healthy, your kidneys work properly and if you eat too much salt, it filters it out. It's the, ins it's the too much insulin that stops that happening. So then you get the edema and all of that and it becomes a self-serving problem the whole thing. And then eventually you've got either you know a heart attack or congestive heart failure at the end of the so the causes are high blood pressure and derangement of molecules via oxidative damage and or glycative damage, both of which are also ameliorable. The only reason that we're not really doing a great job of that, I guess, is because the medical establishment is still firmly focused on believing that LDL is the causal agent, which is akin to blaming forest fires on the fire crews, frankly. It's that ridiculous. So that's basically the etiology, which means the cause, the underpinning of heart disease. Thank you very much for that. Um, one other quick thing that I want to go over here before I, you know, let you go, because I'm going to be cognizant of your time. You have said, you have said many times on your channel that insulin resistance is a construct. Yeah. And as I understand it, it's not pathological. It's the actual body's response via the Randall cycle that causes all of these things to go and not go. Can you give us, as somebody on my Facebook page, I told them we were going to be having this conversation, and one of them asked, could you have Professor K give us a quick little explanation on the Randall cycle for dummies? First of all, it's not a cycle, and it's called a cycle because the bloke that first proposed it called it a cycle for some reason, and the name stuck, but it's actually not a cycle. It's a, it's a series of reactions that occur 
from start to finish in a chain, they don't link back up with themselves so much and cause a cycle to run in one direction or another. What is the Randall cycle? Okay. In effect, take out all the flowery bits and all the different reactions and things that you don't need to know. What you need to understand is this. Your body is designed to run on a nutrient profile which is rich enough in protein and rich indeed in animal fat and very, very poor in carbohydrate. You can have a diet which is equally safe regarding the Randall cycle in a reductionist sense. And that you could say, well, I have a diet which is rich enough in proteins, which I disagree with the vegans, I don't know if they don't. But let's say they do. But it's also rich in carbohydrate, and I'm taking the fat out. It's a fat-poor diet. Both of those diets will deactivate the Randall cycle problem to a large degree. The Randall cycle problem being that you cannot metabolize a significant amount of fat and carbohydrate at the same time. They will cross inhibit each other. They will block each other out for access to the mitochondria to provide energy. And as a, as a, a knock-on effect of that, what will actually happen is the redox level in your cells will drop and that will cause inflammation. In nature, there's really only one food readily available in nature in its natural form that I can think of that is rich in both carbohydrate and fat. And that's milk, mother's milk. We also know that the only way that you can possibly gain fat is to be in an inflamed state because the metabolic process, the metabolic machinery to run in that direction has to, there have to be activation of various inflammatory cytokines to make that occur. And so it seems to make sense that at a time when a child is wanting to put on a lot of fat and a lot of condition very quickly, the best thing to do is to feed them a mixture of sugar and fat, which is what mother's milk is. And they do put on a tremendous amount of fat on that particular you know, food-based item that is appropriate for that child at that time of their life. Once you're weaned, though, the Randall cycle becomes a real issue if you want to start mixing your carbohydrates and fats because it's going to cause a chronic, non-ending, systemic inflammation over years and years and years that leads to heart disease, obesity, strokes, diabetes, early death, dementia, and all of that stuff. You don't want that. So that's what the Randall cycle is in a nutshell. It says that fat strongly discourages carbohydrate for oxidation, and the inverse is true in that carbohydrate strongly discourages fat oxidation. It's a way of the cell basically marshalling and moderating the resources it has to hand and, for want of a better term, burning the most appropriate fuel on the basis of what it's to hand. And it's not expecting you to ever have both to hand at once because that never happens in nature. Animals that eat plants are eating carbohydrates and protein, but very little fat, obviously. And animals that eat other animals are eating high protein, high fat, and very little carbohydrate. So there it is, in a nutshell, without the flowery bits. Excellent. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, I know you do consulting for people that get into trouble and need some advice or just a little friendly pat on the back. Before I let you go, can you tell everybody where they can find you and how they go about signing up for consulting and all of the bits and bobs related to finding you and doing all of the things? Yes. Um, if you go to the YouTubes and you punch in at B-A-R-T hyphen K-A-Y, the first 20, 30 pages of results that come up will be my videos on my various YouTube channels. So you, you can't not find me that way. 
if you were interested in consulting merchandise or other things I'm involved with, you could actually go to https bit dot ly forward slash bart hyphen k a y, and that will take you directly to all of those kind of things for consulting and and whatever else. There's also a link there for Cyril, but if you're interested in Cyril, please use Bob's link rather than using mine. What's your link, Bob? Uh, that would be semiretiredbob.cerule.com. And I'll oh, be putting all of that stuff in the big blank space yep. underneath. So, and screen. absolutely, if, if, if you're not yet interested in Cerule, that's either because you haven't heard of Cerule or because you haven't been listening. So get yourselves across to Bob's Cerule this afternoon and get yourself Cerule to the max, I would suggest. Get it all. It's great stuff. Yes. I want to thank you for your time today, Professor. I really appreciate you being here. Everyone that's watching, be sure and get down in the comments. Thank Professor K for his time. Get over to his channel and watch all of his videos to thank him for his time today. Don't forget, get out there, be 1% better. Today, tomorrow, every day. Have a great day, folks. We'll see you in the next one.